John, this is really the first time that we've sat down together uh, to hear one another's thoughts and story, and I'm really excited to hear your story because I know it's it's filled with, filled with you know, redemption and grace and second chances and also adoption. Yeah. You know, I'm adopted too, so I'm always fascinated to hear about adoption stories. But let's start with adoption as we become, begin your journey and your story. Oof, well, I mean, the adoption story is pretty simple for me in the sense that I was made in Haiti and I was brought here and my, my birth mom didn't really have the, um, well, she believed the necessities for me to have a thriving life. Mm -hmm. And so she put me up for adoption and my mom, uh, Jackie, adopted me with, and that was in their cards was adoption. But my one thing that my, my birth mom did, which I think has stuck with me ever since, is that she in her birthday card, she put Joshua 1.9, not, not knowing where I was headed in my life. And it says, you know, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Mm -hmm. And so that has been with me. But uh, as, I, as I grew up, I, I was having identity issues, and it didn't look like my parents at all. I mean, my parents are, are uh, both Anglo-Saxon, white, like typical. Mine. My right? mom's Ukrainian, my dad's like German descent, and then here I am Filipino. Yeah, right. So very white and right. very brown. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, people, they, 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 they assume something about you on the basis of your color of your skin, right? Because, I mean, it's culturally relevant for them to think that. And, and I'm like, I don't have any of these ideas, and I'm supposed to have these ideas. Mm -hmm. or And I was always wrestling with that in, in, in uh, high school. And, and as I went through high school, I really was more paying attention to who I was not as opposed to who I was. And uh, that really took me down a different road. I didn't have very many options because of my life choices after that. And uh, not that I came from a bad home, it's just I made bad choices. Yeah. And uh, I ended up- I did too, you know, and it's funny that, you know, a lot of people will say, is it adoption or is it just teen angst? Mm. And I just made bad choices. Mm. I mean, part of it was my own insecurity about where I fit and, you know, where I, you know, didn't or did belong. And so, of course, I went, you know, made bad choices as far as, you know, drugs and guys and clubs. But, you know, I think it, in my own story, it kind of came back around about knowing who I follow and my identity in, in Jesus. Yeah. But go ahead. I just, it's, it, it's so interesting because there's a lot of similarities in our story that I didn't know. Oh, well, and that's yeah. it. It's exactly, <laughs> you're, you're seeing some of the commonalities. Yeah. The details might be different, but yeah. there's that commonality. And uh, I, I got out of high school and I didn't really have great marks. Because again, I was wrestling with this identity yeah. issue. And, and so I honestly made the conscious decision to become a drug dealer. I said, well, if I'm gonna, I, I got no other job options really because I don't have an education. Mm -hmm. I didn't really pursue anything like trades or anything. So I was like, let's go sell drugs. And I, I did. And I mean, the, the thing with drugs is that it doesn't really need any kind of marketing plan or anything behind it. You just- no, There's demand. Exactly, right? Yeah. And so you just feel that demand. And, and my, my brother one day said to me, Sean, you know, if you, don't stop now, you're gonna become a big drug dealer because of who you are. And he was talking about the gift that I had about networking and these things, and, and, and he was true, he was right. I, I became a really big drug dealer. And, and, and lots of money, probably, tons. that was probably what kind of kept you or the allure of it too, right? Well, the, the money, you know, to be honest with you, the money wasn't, wasn't the big deal, but it's what the money allowed me to do it was the big allure, right? right? So I was able to have all the women, I was able to go to the club and be the, be the guy, be the shot caller, be the baller, be the guy that had power in, and, and, and command right. in the place, which I wanted, I so craved and desired, but it really was left me empty at yeah. the end of it all. And I remember from time to time, I'd have to take some breaks. And uh, it was a day that I had to, uh, I, I mean, it's one of the things that crushes me most about this living part of my, of my of the testimony is this guy named Igor. And he was a crack addict. And uh, one day he called me and he asked for crack. And I know that when people do crack, they're often going to be spending all of their money that night. And so uh, he called me and I was like, well, let's make some quick money right now. I would just stay in the area until he's done his money. And, but this had turned out to like three, four in the morning. He was still going. And he called me. He's like, this is the last I've got, Sean. And I said, okay, fine. I'm in the area. I'll take the money, right? So I go into this place and it's an apartment building. And he comes down to the apartment building. And it's three in the morning. And I'm a family guy. And he comes down and I, I look to give him the drugs and he's giving me the money. And as I look out, I see his daughter in his arms. I didn't even, yeah. and it crushed me under this unbelievable weight. And I said, I am a part of one robbing from this princess. How can I live with myself if I'm the one? She has no choice in the matter. He does, but she does not. Wow. So then you go to Vancouver after you take this break mm. from like, I'm not going to do drugs. I'm going to go to yeah. deal drugs. I'm going to go to Vancouver. Well, so I, yeah, so I, I had someone else kind of still run the business for me. And uh, I go up into the mountains at Whistler and I'm just snowboarding. And I get a phone call one day and it's from an associate of mine. He says, it's gone. And we're trying to talk, and you're talking in code. You're on the yeah. phone. What do you mean it's gone? And, and basically the, the short of it is that so I've been robbed. All of the money that I had stacked up, all of the drugs that I had built up, all of my empire was gone from me. I had nothing. Wow. 
And oh. uh, you know, you have a couple of bucks in your po pocket, but at some point you get hungry and there's no more money. And so you, you find yourself in a, in a predicament of how are you gonna feed yourself? And so I, I, I found a, a, the newspaper and it had some jobs in it and said, one said, no experience needed. I said, well, I got no experience, then I'm needed. So I went there and uh, when you get around sleazeballs and you've been in that game, you know when you get around someone who's a sleazeball. And uh, long story short, that guy was part of the sex industry and uh, I found myself in the sex industry to fill my stomach. That's what I was doing. I was, I was there in order to feed my stomach. And I remember one day just, just finishing, a shift after finishing a shift. I mean, that's the kind of language we use so that it kind of normalizes what's happening there. But it, finish it, a shift. You finish a shift. You would, uh, you know, you, it, it, you, we worked in this house and we were doing this, this video stuff. And I mean, I'm actually, to be honest with you, I'm really grateful that the internet was not what it is now. Yeah. And, and so uh, when I was in there, I was like, I said the words I wish I had never said in my life at that point in time. I felt so cliche. I said, if I was a slave to my dad, it would be better than this. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is like church all coming back to me. What is this? Yeah. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to call my dad because this is, I, I come from better than this, Sean. You don't need to be here. Yeah. Like you could go back and just, just be a slave to your dad and it'd be fine. It'd be better. So I try to call my dad. I'm in the mountains and the, you know, you have the three bars. It's not working. And finally I get a, get a call. And, and my dad doesn't have a caller ID at this time. It's, mm -hmm. He's a bit of a dinosaur that way, <laughs> landline. And so I'm calling, and I don't know even what to say. What do you say to your dad? You haven't really conversated with him about this kind of thing. And, and, uh, so, and I'm just breathing on the phone. And before I could say anything, my dad says, I love you. And I'm broken inside. I'm broken because all of the things that the enemy has put on me and said, that's who you are. My dad has put these words into my, into the being who I am and restores me to the value that, that Christ paid for on the cross. Yeah, awesome. And so, I mean, every time, literally every time I say that part of the story, uh, it's tears of joy. Yeah. And then God started putting miracle to miracle to miracle after that. I, I, I was telling some of the guys in, in the green room, I'm, in my life, I'm, I'm on a ride. And I can't believe where God has, has taken me. I mean, even in just meeting you. I mean, it was, it, it, it's so surreal. Yeah. But it all comes out of just saying, God, I can't do it. But I'll do what you've got because it's going to be 10 times better than I can do. You know, Sean, it's a beautiful story because it, it, and there's so many similarities with me. But it's like you cannot outrun God. Mm. God's got you. We make really bad choices. Mm. But at the end of the day, the Father will say, I love you. Yeah in the midst of your mess. He yeah. didn't say, your father did not say, now go clean up and now I'm gonna love you yeah. and call you my son. Yeah. It's like the prodigal son yeah. story. He says, I love you in the midst of it. Yeah. And, and that's who God is. So yeah. that sort of reflection of your dad saying, I love you really connects with God, the father as yeah. a whole. That is so beautiful. I wanna continue the conversations. So we'll have to get you back, mm -hmm. but um, thank you. Thank you for your life. And then making the choice to go and, and serve God and do the work that you're doing with youth in Sherbrooke. Yeah. Well, Ottawa then Sherbrooke. Yeah. And so I'm thankful for you. And thank you for this new friendship mm -hmm. and so proud of you and how far you've come. So thank you. Thanks for having me.